Welcome to Libraries Today. This program is intended to recognize and highlight the unexpected ways local libraries serve their communities today. I'm your host, Stan Al. Forty years ago, the West Virginia Library Commission had a vision to create a television studio which would produce high-quality content for all West Virginians. The programming would focus on information, on health, history, community issues, and of course, public libraries. From that vision, the WVLC Library Television Network was born. Now, you may not be aware that the WVLC has a TV studio here in the Culture Center on the Capitol grounds in Charleston. This studio not only produces this program, but over the last four decades has produced thousands of high-quality, diverse programs. In fact, the WVLC Library Television Network produces 220 shows of original programming each year. In today's program, we are going to celebrate the 40th anniversary of this remarkable success story. We'll take a look back at how it all started with the people who made it all happen. In 1978, John Calvert began directing, editing, and handling the camera as the Library Television Network began its 40-year journey. Welcome, John. Thanks, Dan. Glad to be here. Let's talk about the beginnings of, of this studio. You were here from the very start. What was it like? I remember um, when Fred uh, Glazer hired me. Fred was the head of the, the Library was, Commission at the time. Yes, he was head of the Library Commission at the time, and the offices were over on the other side of the Capitol. Because this building hadn't it had, opened yet. It wasn't finished yet. Right. It wasn't finished. It was underway. And the plan was to build a studio, a television studio here. Um, and um, I had to wait about six months to, to actually you know, come here and do the job. So when I came through the door here, um, the studio was here, the grid was on the ceiling, and there was a cart with a television sitting on top of it in here. And I thought, this is, this is really minimalist television. <laughs> I, I, had a lot to, I had a lot to do. So I went about actually building sets and painting and getting things ready to go. Somewhere along the line, you had to come up with cameras and microphones and a set Right. How did you, you mentioned you built the sets yourself. Right. We actually built the, the, the uh, tables um, that we put the equipment on uh, out of tuba sixes and, and formica. I mean, everything we hear was hand built. The sets, um, the, the little risers that we have, that some of them look like they're the they're originals in here right now. <laughs> um, but we, yeah, we did all that ourselves because we were on a very strict budget. We didn't have much money to spend uh, on this entire operation and uh, television equipment for the kind of middle of the road professional was very, very expensive at that time. Were you involved in actually going out and finding cameras and microphones? Well, there was a, a budgeted figure for it in, uh, in the Library Commission's uh, annual budget. Uh, we did have to go and look at different options. Uh, we, uh, Fred, myself, and Dave Scholes, which was an employee mm -hmm. with us, I uh, traveled to Pittsburgh. Of course, to, you were you had worked at WCHS right. TV, so you were familiar with some of the things that needed to happen. Oh, sure. I, I worked um, first out of college at WCHS. Uh, I left CHS and went to WSWP, a uh, public station in Beckley. And at that point in time, Beckley didn't have a studio at all. All they had was a production truck, so everything we did there was remote. So when all this started, what was, what was your vision? What did you want this studio and this network to become? Fred's vision, and I shared the vision, was that there's a lot to know. And television was the emerging technology to make that happen. Well, it had to be a little unusual to have a TV studio in a library setting. Well, I think that was um, a natural extension of the information delivery that libraries mm -hmm. are responsible for. We are a repository for knowledge. Like, like Alexandria's library. Um, and in order to be able to distribute that knowledge or that information out to the, to the public, television was a perfect vehicle for that. It's one thing to, to have the set, have the studio, have people to direct and to be in front of the cameras, but somewhere people have to be able to watch it, right? Mm -hmm. So where, where were people able to access the programming you guys were producing early on? Well, it was available. It was cataloged uh, as if it were any other piece of information. 
uh, or creation. It was cataloged here at the uh, Library Commission and people could come and check it out if they wanted to. Early on, not very many people did because it was all produced on U-Matic three-quarter inch tape and that was not a ubiquitous home uh, type uh, format. Were you broadcasting the programming? Uh, eventually we did get ac access to the cable, uh, a live access to cable, and when that happened things really began to blossom because we were a live, uh, we were a, a, a destination. Being here in the capital, um, public television used this studio to do some of their work during legislative session. Um, we, we sent our television, our shows uh, out to to the cable system and they aired them. At some point, uh, the studio also started using outside uh, talent to produce shows, not necessarily library shows, but shows on agriculture or shows uh, on history. Mm -hmm. uh, when did that start? Um, gosh, you know, putting a finger on the time that that started, I would say probably two or three years into into uh, the development. So of pretty this. early so on. It's, it was pretty early on. We did some some um, some interesting things. We had some uh, some very good um, productions in here. One of them was called Heritage Trunk. It was uh, it was um, it was done by Dolly Sherwood. Um, we worked real close with Archive and History on on that. Uh, the guys over in the shop over here, Bob Shreve, did a marvelous job. He built a Victorian living room in this place. It was unbelievable, like a library uh, wainscoting around the walls. It was great, and Dolly did that in here. What kind of reception did you get in those early days? What were people's reactions? Generally speaking, the existence of this facility here and the things that we did were widely accepted and appreciated. There were some who thought it was a duplication of effort, that there didn't need to be a studio and a staff here because we had public television just up the road. Um, our missions were different, but they were somewhat the same. Um, so there was always an underlying kind of rumble of, you know, are we going to be here next year? Is this going to happen? Are we going to get a, a budget cut and the whole thing's going to just going to go away? Um, Fred did a good job of fighting for us in the early days. And that's when most of the pushback occurred. Uh, after we established ourselves here and over the years with Mark coming in and Dave uh, taking over after I left, um, there was enough in the way of permanence and power, I think, associated with this, with this operation to keep it here as long as it's been here. When you look back at your days here in the studio, what are your best memories? Oh, it was, we were just crazy people. We had, we, we had a motto, if it isn't fun, don't do it. When we needed to be serious, we were very serious. Um, I think there was a lot of production talent around. Um, we weren't afraid to fail. Uh, we just wanted to do the best we could with what we had. And it was a great time. John, thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. We appreciate I it. I enjoyed this. Thank you. <laughs> we'll be back with more on Libraries Today after this. Forty years ago, the West Virginia Library Commission had a vision to create a television studio for all West Virginians, providing them with information on state libraries, health, history, community issues, and so much more. The Library Television Network was born. From the West Virginia Library Commission and the Library Television Network, thank you for sharing this journey with us. The WVLC Library TV Network is celebrating its 40th anniversary. We're taking a look back at some of the people who started it all. Another of the early pioneers with the Library TV Network is Chris Bradley. Chris is now the WVLC Director of Network Services, but he started with the commission right here on the studio floor. Chris, thanks for being with us. It's good to be here. So tell me uh, about what it was like when you, when you first started. Wow. Uh, I came in this door in July of 85, and uh, there was a fellow here named Rick Goodwin at the time who was the engineer and other, other camera guy, whatever, and he sort of led me around, taught me the ropes, how things worked, the on-air playback, and, you know, Dave taught me a little bit about uh, 
directing and camera work and stuff that I hadn't been familiar with. But honestly, the equipment was old and it smelled funny, <laughs> but everything worked and everything did its job. And it's amazing the stuff that was being done with what they had at the time. It's pretty amazing. What uh, kind of jobs did you handle? Well, I did some camera work uh, on the floor camera and uh, when I first started out, and I did some field recording. Went out and shot some stuff on location. And as the years went by, Dave kind of nurtured me along and he taught me uh, technical directing and things. And I, there, there at the end, I was doing pretty good. I could, uh, I could TD live broadcasts. And we did some stuff with uh, Mountain Stage and Band Aid and things that were a lot of fun that were live. And, I learned a lot. It was, it was a good time. It really was. You know, uh, programming is the driving force behind any TV studio. Uh, and programming hours kept increasing over the years. Yeah, was, uh, the popularity of the programming was what was amazing. Uh, we started out with a couple of hours on Capital Cable in the afternoon, like 3 to 5, uh, when nobody's home to watch television <laughs> anyway. But um, it started catching on. You know, local cable companies started picking up St. Albans picked it up, Logan picks them up, Williamson picks them up, um, Parkersburg started expanding the, the broadcast day, then Capital came back and gave us three hours, and then it changed to 12 hours a day, so it just expanded and on and on and on. Now I think they're distributed to cable companies all over the state. It's a uh, big footprint these days. You know, some pretty high profile people that ended up being interviewed over the years on the various shows. Uh, Folks like James Earl Jones, John McBride, of course, governors, elected officials, some pretty big names. There were, and uh, thanks to uh, me being in the studio, I got to meet most of those people in person, and uh, pretty amazing folks. Uh, I got to meet uh, Victor Kayam, the Bremerton Shaver guy that got bought the company. Mm -hmm. That was pretty cool. And, of course, Stephen Koontz, you mentioned. Right. And a lot of other authors. This list is just too long yeah. to go through, but uh, a lot of cool people, a lot of neat times. So you mentioned some of the pioneering programs that you did, you know, Vandalia mm -hmm. uh, Festival. What were some of the other big-time events that were put on over the years? Well, you know, um, in the 80s, we were the first people to do the live lottery drawings. Um, the Lottery Commission was looking for somewhere to do the lottery drawings. It just so happened we could get a signal from here to Pittsburgh so mm -hmm. all the stations could pick it up. So uh, we did the lottery drawings. We'd come here on Saturday evening, set everything up do the live drawings that lasted all of one minute <laughs> and uh, pack it up and do, repeat every Saturday. It was a lot of fun. Those other things, like we did the Vandalia uh, Gathering live in the 90s, the whole weekend live, starting Friday evening, Saturday and Sunday. That was a long weekend, but we did some cool stuff, kind of pioneering, uh, live from the Capitol grounds when the technology was just awful, but it worked. And I will never tell anybody how we did that stuff because they'll <laughs> laugh. So, when you look back at your time here in the studio, uh, what are the kinds of things that stand out for you? Well, it's a lot of fun. You know, where else can you can you get a job that something you like to do and get paid for it? That's pretty neat. And I got to meet a lot of cool people. And and I realized that other people who come in and volunteer, they don't get paid for it. Uh, a lot of the hosts and volunteers that came in over the years, uh, some of them still come in even to this day. I think of... Um, Sharon King, she still does a lot of programming. Um, Randy Dameron, Randy's been here for years and years and years. Um, Dr. Rashid, still doing a show after probably 25 years. I, I have to go back and check the dates. But those guys don't get paid to do it, and, and evidently they love it or they wouldn't be, wouldn't be volunteering their time to do, to do that. And I think they don't get enough appreciation. So thanks, guys, for toughing it out all those years. <laughs> thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. A more recent member of the Library TV Network team is Mike Schock. Mike, thanks for dropping by. Oh, you're welcome. So tell me about your time with the, uh, the Library Network. Well, let's see, I spent about almost 15 years here. Uh, when I was signed on, we were still shooting analog. That had to be a big jump. Yes it, yes, it was, because they had shot analog, I'd say, since the beginning of the studio. Right. And uh, so there wasn't a whole lot of changes in technology, really, except like cameras and what type of tape formats. But as soon as digital came about, it's been pretty much warp speed <laughs> since, yeah. And then HD? Yes, HD. 
Okay. Yes, that, all that lived in a period of, uh, I'd say about seven years, no, well, five years even before I started, they started. Yeah, so 35 years, yeah. it worked one way, in the last five years, things have changed dramatically. Yes, that is, yes, very dramatically. Yes. So what kind of jobs uh, did you do as, as part of the network? Well, I was, uh, I was a videographer. Uh, I was also the guy who worked on broken stuff. <laughs> and <laughs> Mr. Fix-It. Yeah. Uh, the master programmer for rent, rent on air feed, both when we did analog, like we used to do it, run, run it live. Like first, we, you know, multiple blocks during the day, right. ran the first one live, and then an automated. And later we switched to all digital automation. So in charge of programming. And I also helped spec stuff, new stuff. So with our, with our budget within our budgetary guidelines. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, besides the the switch to digital, what other changes did you stand out in your mind over that fifteen year period? I say quality equipment got, you know, better, more affordable price. You had to spend a lot of money, right, to get. So uh, you said new cameras and yeah. So how often did you get out of the studio, and get out and? shoot some things uh, away from the building? Well, we lot like one field shoot per show, plus different projects. Uh, a few times, even five, six times a year. How, what are some of the, you know, when you're, when you're shooting away from the studio, you have some different challenges. Mm -hmm. What kinds of things come into your mind when you think about those days when you're out outside shooting? Uh, controlling the environment. The weather. Huh? <laughs> yeah, the weather. Uh, would interrupt the interview. <laughs> yeah, I guess you had to, you know, kind of be light on your feet when you're out there yep. on the on the road. So, yes. when, so when you look back at your days working there, what are your best memories? What are the things that really stand out? Oh, I see people I work with, getting to meet, you know, get met, you know, deal with you know governors, um, famous people come through. Got to meet like. Um, for example, Sam Huff used to play in the NFL. Oh, the NFL? WBM, yeah. Linebacker with yep. the Redskins and the Giants. Of course, met my wife here. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. Yeah. So it was a life changing experience. Some good memories then. Uh huh. Well, Mike, thanks for dropping by. We appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> We're going to take a break. We'll be back with more on the history of the Library Network after this. In the last four decades, the Library TV Network has produced thousands of shows and been a major contributor to the growth of public awareness for West Virginia libraries. Two of the men most responsible for the success of the network are former director Dave Schuldis and current director Mark Lanham. Gentlemen, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having us. Dave, you started here in the 1970s. Why don't you tell me what it was like when you first walked through these doors? My goodness, what an experience it was. Uh, I can remember walking through the studio doors and everything was piled in just on a cart. But the lighting, the production switcher, even the cameras were all piled right there on a, <laughs> in a cart. So John and I kind of uh, got together and decided, well, where do we want to put this? Where can we put this? Um, so we moved it all back to the control room and started building sets, started building uh, uh, risers started building um, where we wanted our cameras and plots for lighting. Now, a current set, we have about three sets, I believe, here in the studio. Uh, how different are they from what they were like when you were here? Well, they're considerably different. Uh, John and I had to build every set. Um, luckily, uh, we did get some hand-me-downs from Channel 8. Uh, so we did... Uh, uh, get some sets from Channel 8. But for the majority of the sets here, John and I built and painted. What were your biggest challenges in those early days? We were building a studio, a TV studio. This was a new idea and a new concept for a library, library system. So we had to jump that hurdle and, and say we were actually helping the library. We were collaborating with them to enhance their book, but we were doing it with via tape. Um, the other thing John and I had to face was 
how, what type of programming were we going to produce? And it always came back that we really wanted an informational series, something information. So information television was born. So we started asking uh, department heads with state agencies, could we do something with your department? And we got 100% uh, uh, success with people coming over and doing programming for us. And it, it kind of snowballed from there. So your challenge is primarily dealt with getting things started. Mark, you've been here now for a while. Yes. You probably have a different set of challenges. <laughs> yeah. What are the kind of things you deal with? Um, well, we still have the budget challenge. Uh, that's, always the, that's always the biggie. Um, we, we have that. Uh, we have keeping the shows going as well. Uh, some of the agencies come and go, and uh, we have issues uh, with them staying, you know, for a certain long time. Some of them have been here for, you know, 400-plus shows. Some of them do 11 shows, and then you have to move on to another one. It's always a juggling match to schedule everybody in, uh, especially when you're doing somewhere around 22 to 25 shows a month, uh, about 220 shows a year. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a juggling match. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, you both touched on programming, and I, I, as I understand it, the, the early days, the programming and the amount of programming you had to have, very different from where we are today. We, we decided uh, the main thrust was information, and uh, our programming was always had to have a theme of informing the patron viewer. How many hours did you have to fill Gosh, in I the I think we, we, we were on seven hours the first month or two so it was a constant um, fill we had to fill that time mark dave is talking about informational programming i mean why don't you explain what the programming is like today well the programming now is uh, it's still agency based uh we, we try to try to maintain that as much as possible but we also deal with local organizations as well we have volunteers that come in and host shows and they have to stay within that public information or educational uh niche that, uh, that, that, that kind of like what Dave and them started, uh, we've just expanded it just out of just a little bit more. How many hours do you fill now? We fill about 72 hours a week. What is the job of a network director? David? Uh, not only directing the, the programming on camera, but directing the, the department itself you know, with, with staff meetings, with production meetings, with meetings with, with program hosts, with program guests. Over your 21 years, um, how did your role change? My concept was we wanted to complement books in the library with videotapes. That was a hard sell for librarians, for the most part. And so what I did, um, I would say we could enhance this if a patron wanted to see a particular program or a particular series, we could help develop that for you, for that patron, for that library. Um, so it kept evolving. Um, I wanted to go from just the books on the shelf in the library to our developing um, our own uh, channel here in Charleston. Branch that channel here in Charleston to other uh, cable outlets throughout the state. And we were successful in doing that. Mark, in addition to regular programming that Dave and you have talked about, you also do, the studio also handles special programming uh, for the governor, for the first lady. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the special programming you do? Yes. Um, as you mentioned, with the governor's office, uh, we're, we're at his beck and call. If he needs us to go and shoot a uh, press conference or uh, shoot a, an event that he's at, we will go and shoot a, an event and, uh, and, and put that together for them in inter, any format that they want that in. Uh, we also do special productions uh, for the agencies, uh, for the organizations come to us and they want uh, a video produced for uh, either the web, uh, for use to pass around or hand out in, in, a, in, a, in a hard format. And uh, we can produce those as well, either here in the studio or out on location. Uh, and give that to them in, in several different media forms. Dave, what are the kind of things that stick with you most after 
all these years when you look back? Oh, my goodness. The people that I ran into, the people that I was blessed to work with, the creative people that came in to mine and we would sit down and I would always sit down with them in a production meeting and say, what if we could do this? That was always my mantra. What if? And they would say, well, Dave, we could do this, this, this. So that was 20-some years worth of beautiful memories of people coming in, creative minds working and coming up with ideas about programming, about ideas and how-tos and so on and so forth. If I had one person that comes to mind that really set this apart and that really, really saved the Library Commission channel would be Sharon King. Sharon King went above and beyond uh, helping the Library Commission with developing programmings uh, and with developing the structure and the stability of this, this service of the library. Mark, we've been talking about the past. Mm -hmm. What is your vision for the future for the Library Commission Network? Well, expansion as always. Uh, I'd like to go farther out and make sure that more people see what we're doing. Uh, one of the things we'd like to do is, is the facility uh, is not full HD yet. Um, we'd like to, like to get the equipment to, to step that forward. I would like to say that the future is far and beyond what the Library Commission hopes to have. This, this is going to be what Mark is going to be developing. It's going to be a beautiful system. If I ever could say anything great about Mark and extending this and carrying this, this torch on, it would be high praises to Mark. He undoubtedly has gotten the torch and carried it forward. And look at this place. It is beautiful. Dave, Mark, thanks to both of you for being here today. Great. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. We'll have some final thoughts on 40 years of the Library TV Network after this. It's been a remarkable run for the WVLC Library TV Network. Forty years ago, it all started with an empty room. It had to be filled with cameras, lighting, a master control board, microphones, sets, and people. The pioneers of this network had to start from scratch, and they managed to create a legacy of quality TV for the libraries and people of West Virginia. And by the way, you can watch the current lineup of shows any time of the day on the network's YouTube channel. I'd like to thank my guests for being on today's show, former Library TV Network pioneers, John Calvert, Dave Shouldis, Chris Bradling, and Mike Schock, as well as the network's current director and the man who makes this show and many others possible, Mark Lanham. I'm Stan Howe from the WVLC studio. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Libraries Today.